as far as the waiting room goes. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the recording. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday Book Launch. I'm so excited. Tonight we have John Compton, and uh, we are looking forward to celebrating Castration of a Minor God. I do want to say you just are going to, and there's the cover. Thank you. <laughs> I have mine right near me. But um, what's fabulous <laughs> is John's going to be going to AWP for the first time, and not only celebrating this book with five off-site readings you have a new book coming out and are going to read something from that so we're in for yes. uh a big treat and this will be book number what john i've lost count uh, it's that. full length this is full length number three but it's like book number 12 11 i don't know i have like i have like it's like 15 now yeah you've been on fire coming. yeah been on fire so I'm going to read just a little bit of a bio because I really want to get to the good stuff. Um, I mm -hmm. want to get to the reading. And just a reminder that um, I ask people to mute yourself when you are not speaking and um, make sure you do so. And then um, if you'd like to read for open mic, just send me a message and I will. Oh, there's Sandra. We're letting her in, John. Oh, God, we haven't gotten <laughs> too far deep into this. Um if you would like to read, just send me a message and I will be mindful of that. And John, don't worry about the chat section. That's uh, my job. And then I've got uh, help from Karen and we will make sure that we mind that for questions. If you have questions, we will have Q&A. And, &A. and um, thank you all for being here. I'm super excited. Uh, John and I were trying to figure out how we first met and neither one of us can. Um, but <laughs> suffice it to say somewhere during the uh, pandemic, hi, Sandra, it's so good to see you. Um, we started uh, getting to be, you know, hang together on Thursdays and, um, you know, celebrated a, a book together uh, early on there. And so it's been fabulous to see um, a prolific poet uh, getting recognition and opportunities that they um, totally, uh, you know, totally deserve. What are live meeting notes available? What the heck is that? That's from Katie Otter. I don't know who that was, but. I don't know. Someone. Okay. Um, so my, uh, so I'm going to get to the um, short bio. John Captain is a gay poet who lives in Kentucky with his husband, Josh, and their dogs and cats. And if you've never seen the dogs and cats, you've missed out. Um, <laughs> so three full length books and 10. And now you need to update your bio. Uh, 10 I know. Chapbooks. You've got to write 11 chapbooks published and forthcoming. Um, train Ride Elsewhere from Press Wafer, Stranger in the Addict of Clouds, which came out in 2021 from Dead Man's Press, and what we're celebrating today, The Castration of a Minor God from Ghost City Press. I'm going to turn it over to you so we can sit back and enjoy. Um, thank you so much for being here, John. It's really, it's of just course, so thank you for you. having me. So thank you for having me again. This is my second time here, and it's such a great place, and I love it. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna um, read a new poem first, and then I'm gonna read from the up forthcoming chapbook, um, how they liberated, what secrets they modified, and then I want to read from this book, and then I guess I guess that's that. But um, <clears throat> the new poem I wrote the other day, so it's like a really new poem, if I can find it. All right, so it's called. And I wrote it on Valentine's Day. So it's called, Don't Worry, It's Valentine's Day. It's hard when everything's falling apart, my darling. Your slumber into melancholy etches more daunting images on the internal surface of this nullified mannequin skull. You've a symbol to store your mental health. But coming along too hastily, the engraver pushed too hard breaks through bone. Your suicidal hunger discharges. The house is quiet. The thunder of a lonely train rages, its cargo loose. The rattle like some snake comes to wrap itself around my neck. A scaly lace, it pricks while tightening. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. And that was the first poem I wrote in a long time I, because I, because nothing would come. And so I was, I was um, 
Yeah, so I hadn't written anything in a few months because I've been editing and doing other stuff. So I was really proud of that poem. Um, I, it's been a, a crazy week and so and, and a lot of emotions. And so I just wanted to write something that was about what's going on, but also like a, in a loving way. And I'm really, really glad that that poem came. Um, <clears throat> So this is a poem from How We Liberated, What Secrets We Modified. And this poem is titled, My Sleep Deprived Morning Poem. Tiring, my mind adjusts tonight, a yawn, and then an elongated blink. Please surrender your eyes, sleep said, unearthing a perimeter his propaganda to inhabit nightmares and non-consensual terror, wrapped as a gift and laid on the doorstep of my mouth. But I know better. I first drink the blood of the holy man, then retreat into the pages of his prayer or spell. Sometimes these things begin to blur and chanting becomes a song, becomes the beginning of a descent. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, let me scroll here. Let's see. All right, here's here's one I really, really love. And it was published in a magazine recently. And I don't remember which one because I'm a horrible person. Um, <laughs> but it was accepted and published. <laughs> um, it's called Not Like Rice Paper, Like Shrapnel. And there's a quote epigraph thingy um she was not fragile like a flower she was fragile like a bomb and that's by Rao Singe or something I can't pronounce their name but I love that quote um so here it goes the axe head's weight tugs at the handle your firm grip loosens off his shoulders letting breath exit from a balloon's neck a quick rush, and wood splits in two halves, which can no longer secure him to your chest. Distance becomes an orbit while air fluctuates. Thoughts spittle like two birds falling. The splinters wet with sap. The bond of proposal reminiscing and drifting. Our vows now two fractions. An inhale incubates eggshells and infringement. And that's that poem. Thank you. <clears throat> so if you haven't ordered this, oh, wait, let me, then here's the link. Paste, enter. I don't know if anyone did. So if you did, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to go over y'all's faces. But so here's the book and it's $12. Um, but if you order, you get a free PDF chapbook of a different chapbook because some people have been thinking it was you get a free PDF of it also, but it's a whole different chapbook. It's not the same. So it's like two different books for the price of one. And it's called The Skies Fell Revelations and it has its own cover and its own poems. And there's like 20 poems or so. So you get this book and then like a whole nother book. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure, you know, I just, I just, I've got to learn how to advertise this thing when I go to AWP so I can get it down pat and sell, you know, a million copies um, so I can be super famous. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so I'm going to read, and I don't really, I don't think I've really read a lot from part four. Usually I read like the part one and part two poems, <clears throat> but I'm going to read from part four. Oh, thank you, Regina. So this one is called Map of Rust. I rode the wings of the great beast, you, in time and turn your hopeless melody. You sit in the dandelion skulls with piano keys under your eyes to dine in the death voice of your sadist mind. You brought fire to the snow. Each touched lost their individuality becoming all the rest a drop. And that's that poem. <clears throat> and this next one is titled My Morning Mother. And thank you, everyone. My mother slept aversely, though through the night her face unfolded, 
It smoothed over. Her lips were pink earthworms. Her tongue became sober, a softened sword. And bad, she was a cocoon, half exposed. And that is that poem. <clears throat> and that poem is about my alcohol. Ugh. Recently sober, recently drinker. I don't know what she is anymore. But she was an alcoholic. She was a bad alcoholic. Um, she's not an alcoholic. And she does, doesn't get, like, she drinks occasionally now. But it's not as bad. It, it's like sips. Um, so anyhow, it's, it's about when she was an alcoholic. Like, really bad, bad alcoholic. <clears throat> so this poem is titled Anxiously at the Wound. I sleep in the fog of your morning breath. In the overspill, we disappear, catching the hook, the dream glimpse in the murky water, glimpses I shape into your image. I wake empty headed, afraid, confused, weight sewn into my palms. Where are you? The cold wraps me like a grave. And that's that poem. Thank you. And also, Malika, Malika, I cannot, I swear to God, just let me know when my time runs out because I haven't paid attention to Don't call. worry about it. I'll get, keep going. I'll give you a heads right. up. I'm so glad you haven't cussed me out yet for not being able to pronounce your name. I, yeah, I respond to any variation, but it's Malika. Uh -huh. You say it right. It's, and then you Malika, doubt yourself. Okay. You, you it's all them letters in it. No, I know, I kidding. add extra A's. <laughs> oh. All right, this one is um titled How We Bury, bury blah, 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 blah. How We Bury Fish. Let me get a drink. Emotionless womb. You remember your fish. You were eight. It was floating belly up. You tapped on your stomach as a mother, a little girl trying to tap her fish from sleep. You gave birth to a stillborn. My father explained to me how we bury fish. I heard the toilet flush behind my sobbing. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. And this next poem is titled the new slips off your tongue like hot soup. My mother is dying. I prepare myself. And not in the pretend way I write occasionally about when she was a functioning alcoholic or when it makes a poem more interesting. My mother is dying. Her kidneys rebelling, becoming cirrhosis. She sits in front of me, relays the far too familiar information she is used to the idea of dying. Death has loomed inside her for years now, hibernating, waiting for spring to wake and fatten. <clears throat> and that's that poem. And just so y'all know, my mother's been down for 20 years. Oh, my Lord. A new thing comes, tries to kill her, and just loses, I tell you. Um, <clears throat> this, was, this was like 10 years ago when she told me this info. She's still kicking it. Working at Taco Bell, giving me free food. Um, <laughs> and I knew who that person was, so I let him in. <laughs> this one is called Sobriety. My mother grew from the waist. The broken pieces she created, she held in her pockets. She knew eventually time would mend things. She took out each piece until everyone connected in its place in the image she remembered before the monster took all this. And that's that poem. And here's one. I read this one and then I read, I read another poem out of my chat book or something. Throwing rocks. <laughs> I watched the water. Each ripple a cleaving tremor. Soon it grows placid. All resorts to an ending, an ending without. The shadows are too dim to see what for reflections I have caused myself to become. Without is the hope that is fading. 
The water seems to sense something. She pulls me inside. I am a fetus waiting to be born into singularity. Thing. And that's that poem. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Do, 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 do. Let's see. I'm going to read a COVID poem that's in my new collection. I wrote most of it in 2020. Um, so let's grow. It's when I got COVID. It's about me having COVID. <clears throat> it tried to kill. It really tried to. Well, well, it only tried to kill me. If, uh, the first time I got COVID, it was horrendous. But if I moved, it tried to kill me. The second time I got COVID, it was very pissed off it didn't kill me the second time it really tried to kill me I, I didn't even have to move for it to just smack me upside my head don't get COVID it sucks <laughs> so this one's called the bedroom box and it's in my forthcoming chat book that pre-order should be soon hopefully soon sometime in February we don't have an official date yet um, my publisher is etched press and it's Kevin Dublin or Dublin. I'm, I'm horrible with names. And and they're a brilliant poet also. They're super busy. So they're working on it. They're working, working, working real hard. Um, <clears throat> so this one's called The Bedroom Box. I lock myself on the moon. My husband observes me through a telescope, examines my mouth, but can only imagine words. The whole celestial system guards us. Because my breath is a meteor shower that will break through him. Packaging clouds in my body, my head swims in methane. I feel my skin's weight but hang like a thunderstorm. A star collapses behind my ribcage, forming a black hole, absorbing air from my lungs. I breathe deeper, trying to draw oxygen from the gravitational force to transfer it to the blood, to be delivered to its locations. My extremities tingle, remind me of jazz and the saxophone, loud yet beautiful. It takes time to, per to perfect, the to hone the skill. It takes time to calm down after the notes hit hard enough. You can't imagine listening to anything else. I perform a dance with my hands and feet, they won't calm down. The blood cells are jazz. I cough and discard years of smoker's lung into my palm. The black flame with the clear sheen jellied and rifts in the unknown. And that is that poem. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I still have time. I'm reading too fast, aren't I? doing great. I slow down and I no, you're doing <laughs> fabulous and oh just yeah keep going and um yeah the, I can't wait for you to see the comments uh, a lot of us are putting up the same lines that are oh right that's awesome here. all right so I'm gonna go give me two seconds I'm gonna read some poems from the sky fell revelations which is the free chapbook free pdf chapbook you can get if you order my full-length book through the website. There's the code. Oh, you can't see that. Never mind. It's too bright. Um, <clears throat> so um, this one is fun. It's the only poem I've ever purposely written. I had someone ask me if I would write a poem for the anthology they were making for M Midnight Mass. And if you've not seen that show, it's brilliant and crazy and scary and creepy. And the lady who plays the Christian lady I hated her guts and she should have won an award because she played that role amazing. And she plays in another show that um, I recently, oh, the Midnight Stories or something, um, or it's on Netflix. Anyhow, this one's called The Cure to Morality. Death came alarmingly and smothered our emotions under a burden so fierce we broke. How do we turn each one like a bone to a body to transgress their endings from a burial we'll never examine? Transcend, drink the communal blood, die to live. And that's that poem. <clears throat> All right. So here's a, a poem. It's called 
How to leave words from a love letter. Today, I memorialize dying, braid the soiled ribbon through my tissue. Eventually, it will register. This is not a speculation. Tighten, cut off blood flow, and prepare to do as instructed. That is when the smile becomes real. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. I read, hmm, oh, good Lord, my stupid phone. All right, so this one, I like this poem. It's called Dark Pulmon, it's called that. Dark Pulmonary Things. The mattress nodded from years of misuse, a lump like a mound of hard snow and four holes. Our dogs hide their faces in and bark. Do they hear an echo? Imagine groundhogs, pretend spring will arrive early. Envision flowers, modest and bright, blooming from frayed edges. Threads ingrained their way into the floor. My room is an ecosystem, tempting trillions tipping. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you, and my, my, my dogs have their own mattress. And they've literally absolutely destroyed it. It's like this now, and there's holes all in it. And you know, I'm pretty sure they think it's a whole new world in there. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see. <clears throat> this, this one's untitled. Let me get a drink. We speak in relativity. Your aged voice interlining the mouth, tumbling, baiting, setting a hook. You have purpose to prosper, not to linger like a child in someone's hand. <clears throat> and that's that poem. Thank you. <clears throat> and I've probably read this one, or I, I know I've read this one, so some of you have probably heard this one, and I'm sorry. And I don't like to repeat poems, and I try not to, but I like this poem. Um, it's about my, and you'll, some of you will be like, oh yeah, it's about my grandmother. She died for 12 minutes, and then she came back to life. And she told me she should have died a whole lot, a long, long ago, because she's never felt better in her life. Um, and she also um, believes in God. And and um, not, and he really can't call. It. She's a weird person. She believes in God and heaven and all that. But then it gets crazy. But so <clears throat> she's very religious like that. And so of course I'm going to ask her, "Did you see any pearly gates, angels, God, whoever?" And she said no. She said it was the most beautiful sleep she's ever had. It was very relaxing. It was tranquil. It was quiet. Um, and she said. And and so it was it was the, don't no one go die on me. See, um, but it made me like not sc be scared of death as much because I'm really good at sleeping and I can sleep very well. I do it every day. So if dying is like sleeping, I'm 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 getting you know I don't a lot of practice. So um, so I wanted to write a poem for my grandmother. Um, so this one is that this is the poem. Her body woke fifty years younger. Both my grandmothers have died, but my father's mom, mother lay dead for 12 minutes, resurrected like Jesus in the back of an ambulance, IV staked through her wrists. She tells us about her death dream, a void of space that curls her into nothingness, cleanses her thoughts and memories, abolishing her weakness and strengths, transforming her mind into an infant, birthing her soul back into a body that no longer knows what age is. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. And that's what happens when you drink carbonated drinks while reading, you burp in the middle of your poem. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, and then like, and it's it was so weird because beforehand she would she had no energy. She didn't leave her house. She would fall asleep in the middle of talking to you. She coughed constantly. Afterwards, she she got a wig, which is silver and purple. My grandmother is like 
my grandmother like lived in a dark room and wore black. So this, it was great. She said, I seen it and I had to have it. Um, she like, she like runs around the house now. She cooks constantly. She goes out and drives around. Um, she like literally cleaned a whole, she had a storage room like in her house. Um, she literally cleaned the house all out, everything. And she just talks 100 miles an hour now. So it was, it was like, weirdly, death really rejuvenated her. Um, <clears throat> so can I read a really crazy poem? Is that okay? It's like far out there. Is everyone cool with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you'll know what I mean. So no one hate me. Well, anyhow, it's it's about um, Republicans. Um and I hate Republicans. I'm sorry. I mean, I love people. I'm just, they're monsters. So this is called, and it's a sad poem, and it has words in it. It has words in it. I've only read this poem one time, and it was to a much smaller group than this. It's called The Republican Father. Period blood and honeydew for the faggot son. Clean your palate and lick the clit. Let's make a man out of you. God is like your sex pistol. I didn't raise no pansy boy. He made each human with a dick and or pussy. Man's the key and this is the lock. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, but yeah, I'm just sick of Republicans and especially now, and I wrote this before all their crazy, let's, <laughs> that's that poem. Oh my God, I need that. You gotta send that to me. That's beautiful. Um, this uh, and and it was before they they're now just trying to destroy all all LGBTQ stuff. And and the craziest one I think is Florida is doing the law where girl teen girl people under eighteen who want to play sports has to document their periods and tell them when they have their periods so they know they're a real girl. Like. No. <clears throat> so, <laughs> just a lot of frustration. Oh, this one's a fun poem. This one's, I say wordy, but it's not wordy as in long. It hasn't, it doesn't have a title. <clears throat> Where do you go when you don't, but when you reflect on what's, what was went? How far is enough when you've broke and before broken was a thought, a thought before the broken is too far to comprehend and far is as far as far can go. I'm tired of being just a being. That poem, uh-huh, see, I told you it was wordy. Um, <laughs> all right. Oh, here's one, it's a bit crazy. I save them. I usually don't read the crazy ones. I save them so you can, you know, buy the book and then, you know, pull your eyes out. Um, <laughs> so this one is called The Constitution of Alzheimer's. And my grandmother, the other one, my mother's mother, she's dead. Um, we didn't have a relationship towards the end. I didn't talk to her for like 10 years. Um, she was the, the B-I-T-C-H um, and a horrible person. She put religion over everything and she used Jesus to hate people. Um, so, um, but she did get Alzheimer's. And for some people, it was really wonderful because she forgot everything. She forgot she was a horrible person. And some people mended the relationship with her before she died. And so I looked, I looked more into Alzheimer's and I wrote some poems on Alzheimer's. And so this is like one of those. Um, before I forget, I sift to find importance life a scavenger hunt fragments of youth linger my shared bedroom with sense of mowed grass my grandmother's black coffee filtered into her cup blood puddles gravel from the dear dad shot the hide comes off easily with a knife and quick tug like undressing your date, his head stuck in the opening of the t-shirt, the odd fingers against his belt buckle, the release of pants falling from the knees. And that's that poem. 
and 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 most of the time I'm if you know everyone here knows me I'm a morbid person I write dark poems and I found it really fascinating because my my parents hunt um and that's how they survive they eat they hunt they don't they don't do it as a sport they don't go and kill anything and they use everything um because there's a lot of people out there that are horrible monsters and that's how they survive and I thought it was really cool to see to like make like undressing your date into the same image as an undressing a deer high you know like pulling the hair off and, and and the morbid fascination of that was like what the crazy and so I wrote it um, this one's about COVID. I had a friend, um, in the beginning, he passed away of COVID and he was 23, 25, sorry. Um, he was 25 and he passed away of COVID and we used to work together and he was, uh, he was white and he was a rapper and he was, <laughs> and I say that and I giggle because he was really good at it and, and, and he was funny too. And so we worked at a restaurant and then we, after we left, we'd go to Denny's, another restaurant and eat. Um, <clears throat> and so, and so after we leave Denny's, he would like wrap in the car and the windows would be down and, and he'd always be like, do you like that? And I'm like, yeah, I like it. Why wouldn't I like it? Um, so, so he was a wonderful soul and wonderful spirit and he was really goofy and crazy. So I wrote this poem for, for him. For my friend who died of COVID at 25, leaving our job for late night drives, ordering at Denny's too many burgers and fries, deeming daily milkshakes our national anthem. We wear hats backwards, wanna be rebels. Your wraps fly out the window and join with the night. And that's that poem. <clears throat> Thank you. I feel like I've read for three hours. I just feel like I'm, oh. <laughs> You haven't read for three hours. Let me, I, and I do want to let people know if you have a question, um, you know, put it into the chat section and we're heading towards Q and A. Cause I, I know I, I've seen a lot of like themes coming up, John, which we'll go over. All right. And, and I have, okay. So uh, thank you. Um, not to try to talk over you. I have two forthcoming, two more forthcoming chat books. Um, there's blacked out borderland from an ex Exponential Crisis, which is coming out through Ethel, um, Zion and Micropress in September of this year. And then there's Melancholy Arcadia, which is coming out from um, Small Harbor Press in May 2024. Those were total accidents. They say submit a lot because, you know, you submit a lot and you get a lot of rejections and just happen to submit a lot and everything got accepted. Um, wasn't supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> so I read one from that one one from that um I'll go to I really like this one um I did the, these poems if I can find them that I read I watched um movies about poets and then I wrote poems <clears throat> and this one's not the only one that I actually went with the poet and the poem the others really didn't. I just started writing as I was watching whenever came came. But this one is called Williams, William Carlos Williams. <sighs> Pulling the red wheelbarrow before breakfast full of plums, will squeak through the house to the operating table to inspect how the knife carves through their skin, how each piece cleaves free. Rather, hunger subdued me. So I ate every last one, leaving a glazed plate as the note. And that's that poem. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, here's, or you have to say something? You have a question that came up and um, it's from Donna and Zach second. Um, how did you come up with the name for uh, Castration of a Minor God? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> see like I hate like a lot of questions but sometimes the questions are very smart and my answers are very stupid um <laughs> so it just like I just think I just think about um um well this one was a little different me and me and my editor Tommy Sheffield who's amazing and brilliant and I forever use them to edit my poems because they crawled into my head we were going but it had an, a different title mm -hmm. 
And then, um, so I have to I'll recycle that title and it's going to be a title of something else. But we're just talking back and forth about stuff and we had ideas about lighthouses. And then just all of a sudden, the castration of Minor God just popped into my head and I was really lucky. And 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 it might have been a little different. I'm not 100 percent sure, but it just it just was there because um, he didn't <laughs> he didn't like the original title. He said it didn't it doesn't fit your poems. And I was like, I don't care. I like the title, but I'm glad. I'm glad we 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 talked about it and and come up with this title. Um, and I and and so afterwards we we then we cut we cut around what the title meant because really it, um so the castration for inside the poems the castration is is like the religious themes um trying to cut out the gay and the lgbt and stuff and then the minor god would be me because you know i'm doing the best i can do um and and i'm being triumphant blah 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 blah. so so that but the the book is a lot more than just um real gay poems there's family there's mental health there's love poems um there's all kinds of stuff and then kevin and i had a different and if you can see the cover um then kevin my publisher i have two publishers named kevin now mm -hmm. so kevin he i had a different cover and literally like 10 minutes before it was done kevin's like uh, he's like this covers there's no central theme and it just doesn't work with the title i can't find a good place can i change it and i was like no um because <laughs> my idea and for all the books I've, I've done in the past, I've used people I've known, the artists and photographers I've known, and, and it's been personal. But, and that's what I was using. But it really was, it was a weird painting and it was just like blobs. So he's like, well, let me show you this. He's like, I really think you love it. I'm like, fine. And literally, and as soon as I seen it instantly, I was like, yes, because it's perfect. And this is a photograph of a boy in 1920s. So it's a real boy, a real photograph. And it looks just like me when I was younger. Like that was me, like in the, I was per, I was a professional businessman when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I always had, you know, button up shirts and dress pants and look good to go to school every day. So it looked like me and it was emotional. And I liked how the like, and the little weird stuff looks like ghostliness and stuff. So anyhow, I said, yeah, and that was, that was the cover. Um, and then for the chapbook, I had a cover out in. He said no, and he, he said, I have a better one. And so we went with his also on that. But um, it all worked out. I love the covers, and I love the title. And thank you for that question, and sorry I rambled. That was a, it was yeah. cool to hear the backstory with that. And there's mm. another there's another couple of questions in here. Sandra was saying, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about your writing process, like do you have a day or a night of or um you know time that you write <laughs> and where do you write and how often do you revise? I wake up um doing poetry and I go to sleep doing poetry. That is I've literally I write I write constantly or I don't write at all there's no set time or place it's just whenever I want to whenever something bubbles inside of me and what I mean is I wake up doing poetry and I go sleep poetry I have literally um dedicated my life to poetry if poetry literally if there was a uh, um a Thanos um in the marvel university snapped his fingers 50 percent of people went away so if there was like a fan of, i was like i hate poetry and snapped his fingers and poetry left the world i would be hopeless i wouldn't know what to do i've literally did nothing else oh uh, when i started writing i loved it and i'm like this is what i'm gonna do and i'm gonna try to do everything humanly possible with poetry and that's what i've done and and so literally i wake up and go to bed poetry I write whenever I want to whenever a thought comes in my head whenever I feel inspired the best times is when I'm driving just love that yeah. um <laughs> I'll be trying to like magically type my poem while I'm driving and not looking and sometimes it's real fun to try to read it afterwards um but but lately um Josh is is the phenomenal secretary so I'm like, Josh, get the phone, open it up to email draft. And then I'll just tell him and he'll write it down and I'll go fix it up or what I have later and stuff. But um, was, was there a part, is that, is that a good answer? 
Oh, it's perfect. And actually, you're answering some okay. of the questions that are coming up too, John. So that's <laughs> I'm fabulous. Sorry. And Laura called them danger poems, driving and writing. Um, yes. And Andy said, I love how unfiltered, honest, and real you are. Um, <laughs> Cynthia asked, do you write longhand or type? And that you kind of answered that. Um, and then also, Zach had questions about, you know, how do you get your poem? Can I, can I answer, can I answer yes. part of that question, longhand type? Because it's 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 real. I love the answer because I'm obsessed with typewriters, oh. and so until like three years ago, I would write everything on paper, obsessively, and I'd write it and write it and write. It. I could write one poem thirty times, um, because every time I scribbled, I rewrote the whole poem, and then I would type it on typewriter. Um, and I love typewriters. I love the way the they make music. And I'm obsessed. And then I had a typewriter, dad, and so I got a cell phone. Um, and now I, I type everything in drafts of my email. Um, and it's been it's been a lot easier. I, I hate technology. I really do. Um, but it's been a lot easier to be able to just type it out real fast. Um, because my I can type about as fast as my brain works. Um, so, so now I type everything and, uh, but at the same time, I don't keep any, um, previous versions I've never have. Like, even when I rewrote stuff, I'd throw it away when I got rewritten, rewrote it. And so like, there's no, you know, if, if I become big and famous enough my, and they're like, oh, we're going to do a home, you know, a room in a museum for you, that you're going to walk into my books and it's basically going to be empty because there will be no history of my poetry. Um, but at the same time, I'm a hoarder. I tend to hoard stuff. And I know that if I were to keep my poems, uh, then I would never throw them away. And there would be 10 billion poems just everywhere. And I would just live in my poems. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted, I just, I just like to talk about like the typewriter and, and the writing. Because um, that's what I used to do for a long, long time. Yeah, um, and uh, okay, so I'm glad question. Cynthia asked that question because yeah. I haven't really thought about the music of a typewriter. Well, if people oh, want to unmute so we sound. can just, you know, give a moment to say thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank that was you. great, John. Thank you. I appreciate it's always it. great to hear that you. That was really good. good. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, I appreciate fabulous. that. John, thank this you. was fun. John. This was fun. It I'm was so a glad you had fun, and it was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank that makes you. me feel so good. <laughs> thank you so much. It was. I was just lovely to um hear the stories too. That's one of the things I, I have always loved about mm -hmm. you, John. You know, the, the stories themselves are as fascinating as the poems. And um, I, I did want to circle back to something Zach said about the tightness in the poems. And I think a lot of us wrote something about you know the um the the master of the small you know the short poem and and how their powerhouse and zach if you want to phrase your question because i'm trying to find it in the chat section just unmute and, and ask it directly that'd be great yes that <laughs> yeah sure um so i mean yeah like malika said really really tight poems even four poems um and um i was just curious if there's anything particular that you um do in your revision process or in your writing process to get that to happen are you someone who just like um cuts like writes two pages and then cuts it indiscriminately mm -hmm. for the best lines like how do you go about doing that well i have a i just want to say you mentioned the the right two poems and cuts i have a friend who writes literally 40 like 40 pages of notes to write like a 10 line poem i would jump off a cliff um Mainly, um, I'm, I'm t uh, like when I think a poem's done, I'm really scared to continue it because I feel like I'll ruin it. So, and I used to write, and and lately I've written more longer poems than I used to. I used to write really short brevity, like short, short brevity. But in my head, it's it's my editing process. I edit as I write, so I edit each line as I write it, and then I edit each stanza, and then when I'm done, I edit it and. A week later, I, and then like when I'm done with the poem and I feel like it's done, then I put it in a manuscript, my manuscript, um, and then I don't edit it again until the, I feel like the manuscript is done and I want to send it out. And then I go through and I edit all the poems again, or go through them and read them and dig into them again. So I edit a poem like a million times. I edit it as I write it, and when I'm done writing it, and then later on. But um, 
but I don't take months and months to write a po like I've heard some people take weeks and months like I usually write a poem in like a day like but um, I mean I may spend like eight hours in that day on it but but usually I don't take two over a day to write a poem and if it's not working out I do the horrible unthinkable and I just delete it because I don't need to stress about it because if it's not working then if you if we're not having a good relationship then you're not meant to be um <laughs> <laughs> but that but I don't want to stress over, over yeah. huh? no I love that I, answer I, I mean I think it's, it's interesting not... for us to, <laughs> to hear how different people approach it mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah, well, I thanks love for writing, asking though. the question, Zach. Um, thank so you, Zach. we're gonna head towards open mic. I've got quite a list. So um, thank you so much, Sean. It was awesome to be in your company and congratulations on you know just the prolific writing and uh oh, thank you. Just you know, you'll get to see the comments, you'll get to see the po you know, the lines that were resonating. A lot of us <laughs> write, like three or four of us at the same time would write the same line. So it's cool. <laughs> Are you, may I ask you a question? Because I don't want to read the comments as people are reading their poems. Are you going to send me all the comments? I am. So I can read yeah, them? I'm going to, oh, just God. like last time, I'll send you the whole text. Yeah. Oh, good. That way you don't, you know, you, that's not yours to worry about. I'll mind yeah, sometimes I've you. been to readings where, where people start reading an open mic and I'm trying to read all the lovely comments because once it's gone, it'll disappear because they're not recording or anything. So I'm trying to like listen and read and appreciate. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> yeah it's too much to uh, like multitask really mm -hmm. um, so uh, Gary I'm coming to you first and I'm just reminding people it's one poem <clears throat> and that's perfect thank you good evening everybody thank you John I will see you tomorrow night I reckon um this got started at a workshop about two years ago and I forgot about it and then about a year ago I came across it again and I thought, uh, right now I can't find anything I want to change. So I'll set it aside for another year. So I did and I changed two words. Um, this is an Ars Poetica, but since it's in the form of a prose poem, I guess the title is Ars Prosa Poetica. It opens with an epigraph by Frank Zappa which given our conversation before the poetry began, I don't know if it's true as far as poetry is concerned. Frank said, art is creating something out of nothing and getting paid for it. A poem is recollection repurposed, rearranged as all the senses surrender to what was and might be better. Perhaps the poem guides the one who writes it all the way to its open ending, or only the first letter of the next line, or sets it aside for another decade. This poem is probably performed on the only stage the moon can afford and forgets its lines, but its oxygenated exertions are better than the original ad libs. This poem is a shaggy dog as true as the furry sky we're under. Maybe it will find a home it has known or be welcomed by better owners. The kind that write poems in as many syllables and breaths as are needed, but leave something for the reader to inhale. Who wouldn't want to wag a tail, release one's own barbaric yawp while thinking of Whitman, curl up with a good thesaurus, memorize each wild and delicate thing worth writing. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Gary. That was awesome. Oh, may I mention something real fast? Sure. Yeah, trying to see. So, who yeah, what Gary was talking. What Gary was talking about is the JoJo show is coming back, mm -hmm. and so, but it's going to be different. It's not going to be on Zoom. I found a podcast thing that we can record it on, so people can listen. It'll be audio, so people can listen to it and still play on their phone or clean their house or drive their car, whatever they're doing. Because originally it was on Zoom and you had to watch it. But now it's going to be audio file where you can listen to it and do other stuff also. So it'll be every Friday um, and we're going to record it and then do all that stuff. So, so yes, I'm very excited about that. Uh, congratulations. That's awesome. The Thank you. Show. Zach, I'm coming to you. I remember to unmute. 
Hey, hey, everybody. Hey. John, thank you again for that completely phenomenal reading. I'm so glad that you were um, dipping into a bunch of different projects. It was really fun to um, get to see the connections across your your work. It's it's really cool. Your voice is just like there in every single one of those projects. And I know that you probably wrote them within like two years of each other, but still it's impressive. Uh, so I'm just going to... I don't know. I, I I had I had kind of an angsty piece, an angsty piece, perhaps, but um I, I don't I've been thinking about this um poem I wrote a little while ago and just that it was fun. Um and it's about Top Chef. Um for folks who don't I don't know if folks here tend to watch Top Chef, but it's like a fine dining cooking competition. Um and so, um, yeah, I was writing about a lot about queer desire, body image at this point, I don't know, three years ago. Um, and so, yeah, that's this poem. Um, this is called Top Chef Season 13, Episode 8 on Microgreens. Oh, and it is written in a bunch of uh, stanza long, stanza length sections. So there's just a, some jarring pivots. Where's the beef, someone says. Tom Colicchio holds up a tiny radish and shakes his head, dainty, dainty, the plant almost breaking between his fingers. It's muscly proteins that he wants, food that can withstand being torn apart with bare hands, gnashed between teeth with what care he decides it deserves. Morning Affirmation. Men don't see you and notice every flaw as often as you think. No evaluative eyes peeking into shower stalls. Don't worry. Men don't take you in for longer than a glance. Dish concept. Using proprietary technology. The taste of my finger in a man's mouth without them ever needing to come close to my bony wrists. My partner's ex would only eat cheeseburgers, and who wouldn't want that in another person to be welcomed like American cheese oozing between fingers, sweet taste of iron making teeth ring? Sometimes I think I smell the problem trapped in the back of my fridge, that I could never prepare myself carefully enough to share this body, spoon myself between lips, be a broth dripping from chins. I lie in bed and wonder, are these legs like roots growing out of bed sheets, dirt crumbs clinging to hairs, every inch a tangled mess of cells? On no reservations, there was a chef who tried his own tasting menu every month because if you don't love what you make, how could anyone else? Google suggests that I take a look at Padma Lakshmi's scar. All at once I remember how curious we can be, how inquisitive fingers may seek out imperfections to be close to, arrows on the body gesturing towards the parts that want to be found. Dish concept, my skin shivering against a metal plate, family style, flesh for four to six, full table of hands fighting for mouthful after mouthful, call my stretch marks marbling. Recipe, pancakes in the morning after, a man who knows to put wet in after dry, warm butter falling into flour, oil licks off fingers, eggs, sugar, salt, him flipping pancakes, skillful wrist, his fingers wrapped around the pan handle tight like his palm could swallow it all in one gulp. Morning affirmation. You look like the sun gave you attention while you sat in soil. Like if you were served raw, all the wispy fibers, your loose shaking parts, would send light back out. Chlorophyll flares singeing diner's hair. It's sunny and clear, but I still see you from a mile away. Even if your neon glow was just a road stop sign, I'd want to pull over and eat. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Zach. That was awesome. Ah, oh, once again, y'all are bringing the fire. And there's comments. So remember, um, after you've read, to just uh, check the comments. Uh, Donna, I'm coming your way. Give me just one second. Okay. Well, this poem was inspired by a piece of art, and it's uh, called The Doctor is In. And so the title of the poem is The Doctor is In. It's by Janet Orselli, the, the artwork. Um, 
and I wrote it um, uh, for my very bored psych psychiatrist. <laughs> the doctor is in, starched and white, waiting to get started. He pours coffee from a thermos, adds evaporated milk and sugar, swirls around and around in a green leather chair that wobbles and stirs him up like scrambled brains like scribbles on a prescription pad, only it's my white shirt that waits and waits and my scrambled brain that wobbles and stirs to find that one broken synapse that can reconnect the coffee, the milk, the sugar. Oh, wow. Awesome. Thank you, Donna. Wow. Mm. Rodina? Coming to you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so this this poem, I'm reading this, I'm reading this poem because um uh in honor of castration of a minor god. Um I too uh often use uh small gods, minor gods, or got little g gods to talk about us people. This is entitled Gods Around Me. Gods around me jump and praise and wave their hands in victory and move in close to me so that I can know and I can see God in them. What about them? Those gods with God in them. What about God in me? The swollen prideful say that I can only feel God this way, their way, huddled with them in their space. But I feel God moving in me, telling me that these messages can flow out clean and fall on a page, a screen, a stage, float in the air, allow others to see and me to know that we gods and God are not the same. We gods, fragile earthborn life of a, nest, of a lesser name. True God has not forsaken, still moves in the righteous, seeking in pews or tents or roads or hidden or anywhere undefined and puts up signs of direction to soothe troubled minds. God moves in these gods as fire in the brains, the bones. We gods, pews and elsewhere, may crumble, fail, tire, and fall, but this God fire will never leave us alone. I believe, feel the heat in my brain and in my bones and in my heart. God burns away the beliefs of a broken babble, sets a flame that stirs my frontal lobe as pen and lips construct an altar that offers, consoles, praises, cajoles, dance, weeps until deplete. Yet God is a well that fills small gods again and again. Gods in pews told me this that the God in my mind and bones never leaves me alone. Creator, mother, father, savior, spirit, peace, judge, avenger, comfort, sparking life, knowledge, discernment, prophecy, truth. We gods in those pews, those that love me the most, told me to be a house, a temple, a host, a sojourner, a light, a bearer of God fire, music in the air, and God fire in my bones will never leave me alone. Oh, Regina, that was gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, yeah, L look at the uh comments please um and i just wanted to let people know we're you know we're at time I, I if you can stick around we've got two four six eight more readers um andy i'm coming your way and say something if i can't find you there i found you you're muted andy i have it i have it um, all I'll say about this is, um, this is, this is written in honor of a stunning 50 year old woman who was a student of mine and she committed suicide, a homecoming, an invisible queen, a ghost town, 
mourners file into your home. Gather in the dining room intended for birthdays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, around the table used by your husband for gutting fish set with a makeshift cloth instead of his boning knife, razor sharp, sit stockpiled photographs, two inch thick faded heaps of Shelley. You, Miss University of Florida smiles on a float, summer breeze and sunset shimmer streak your hair Hold a bouquet, some memories and pretty eyes over your satin sash, over your heart sounds. At the beach, tip, chin, brown eyes drenched, denying rain. Your smile refuses to wilt. Perches atop the Grand Canyon, free falls all the way down the color of your sore throat. Childlike. I stand beside mahogany, distressed. I wait, wish this moment was your birthday. You would blow out candles. Right in front of me, gusts from a window blast through. Winter storms, July. Your photos, your world, your table's harsh surface. Your jigsaw puzzle of life tremble unlike never before. I swear I hear a silence, weightless as a fly's wing, the sound of your gun. Oh, and Andy. What, a, what a, a hard poem to write, but what a beautiful tribute. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Christy, I'm going your way. And make sure, again, I want to remind people to check the chat section because I saw comments going up. Hi, okay, so I'm I'm going to read a short one tonight from um, my chat book, Finding Her Through Finish and Line Press. And I just got to say, open mic is on fire tonight. And John, your ending lines always blow me away. I mean, it was phenomenal tonight. So this is called Gilded Cage. Pretty wants, fill space, false light, blurs, clear doors. It looms knobs that will not turn. Thanks. Oh, knobs that will not turn. Christy, talking about the last lines. Um, Karen, I'm coming your way. All right. <clears throat> I have a short one this evening, too. I just have to tell y'all, I've been reading Ted Kuzer's, um Winter Walks book, and it is such a delight. He wrote it in 1998. And it's a hundred of the postcard poems he wrote to his friend, Jim Harrison. Um, he would write one every morning when he was taking his walks after he had cancer treatment. Anyway, I love him so much. So this is written in response to one of those poems. Um, and the uh, the title is Amble Gate and it's G-A-I-T, like, you know, walking gate. Amble Gate. I want my arms resting on one of those old, heavy, farm road gates that creaks when you step up onto it. I want to lean into it swinging wide to ride its determined glide open. I want its moans to be in my bones as it brings me back to where I started at the edge of a field full of swaying green on a well-worn path that surely will lead me anywhere. Oh. God, that's gorgeous. And I love the physicality of that, that poem. Yeah, it brings me back to where I started. Um, yeah, I've got Cal down as well. Lori, I'm coming to you next. And okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say, John, that was uh, an amazing and wonderful reading. It's it was just phenomenal. And I'm always blown away by your poetry. Um, I've got kind of a short one. Um, this is called Each, Each, Each. Each machine has a narrow slab and each CT tunnel and each MRI tunnel is a space I have to be slid into like a morgue drawer. Cold air flows through each room like I am an embalmed corpse. In each room in which I am examined, 
I have to lie stock still like I'm already dead in a casket made of 10 tons of steel and plastic. And each time beneath a flimsy pastel gown with ties that don't reach all the way round and a pattern of tiny squares like the pastel squares of all my migraines, I am naked, left with no dignity, like it's just me and the embalmer in the room. And maybe it's embalming fluid, not contrast dye they're injecting into me. Ooh. Oh, boy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just yeah. wow. Um, Laura, I'm coming to you next. There you are. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> this is a um, ekphrastic poem after a video titled, titled Salicea by Tourmaline. It's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's called Fiercely Polychronic. Shining wings in orange sky are the people. And while children dance through windblown sheets, you sip tea, rock your friend, sleep in a pile, creep about at night with your lantern and hide the wanted man from the man, bury talismans, flee your island prison walls in sleep. Hear them call to you, the homeless on the river Jordan that is the Hudson. We are not ready to cross. Waking from your dream, take me with you with the birds in the sky, the pool of water reflecting you as you tear at the shackles and flee. We can be anything we want to be fierce. Thank you. Oh, we can oh. be anything we want to be fierce. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's freaking awesome. Um, I've got Don, Chad, and then Cal, just to let you know uh, what, what we're doing now. And uh, Don, where are you? There we go. I see you now. Thank you. Oh, cool. I'm I'm on. John, I really enjoyed the poetry tonight. I almost, I thought it was tomorrow night, so I almost didn't make it. And then I was on Facebook for a second and I saw it was happening and I thought, well, I got to get, I got to get here. And as a matter of fact, John is on my blog. I have a blog. It's very easy to find, donyordy.com. And uh, it's a great piece. And John, next chat book, come on again. Get on my blog again, please. I really had a good time putting you on the on the blog. Okay, I'm going to read a sonnet. Um, I'm working on a sonnet cycle that hopefully will have 360 sonnets. Um, they're getting harder to do. Um, this is sonnet 211. Uh, I don't think I've ever read the sonnet before. I'm supposed to read it on Sunday, so it's kind of practice. So uh, if I stammer or stall, just forgive me. Uh, anyway, sonnet 211. It's better to know something than not to know it, no matter what it is. For an, an example, take the daddy long legs that has come into my vision crawling on my leg. I've known Daddy Longlegs since I was a kid, known many of them. Never has one ever bitten me yet. Yes, what I know says, how beautiful it is. How beautiful it is, what I know says, as I go to pick it up gently, of course, plump, round body, and one, two, three, four, five, six legs, delicate, striding along. So much existence and so slight a thing, walking on my hand like a world turning oh i love that yeah we're on fire with the last lines too um thank you it's so much, been a great Don. reading everybody i mean it's really a hot reading i'm really glad i got here to hear everyone it's it's just been a fabulous evening yeah yeah we we feel uh we feel that every week where, where uh, you know just the the people that we feature and then um the open mic always stellar glad you were here don chad i have come to you now you're on oh yay john says i sound like uh jim varney when i talk so <laughs> i found one uh that makes fun of the way we talk in kentucky uh, it's called love talk kentucky style you people sometimes, when love comes up, get a catch in the voice, something jagged like a fishbone in the throat. 
You take your cue from early dark and winter coming on, the weathercocks arrowing north. Your words come from far back in the mouth. They're austere as rock fences that stutter across hills, up and down ridges. When hounds bell tongue their old hurts and hollers and hard with the year's first freeze. You speak mostly in monosyllables, punctuated by fierce silences, pauses full of terrible meaning, not wanting to risk saying something too bold, what the heart can't hear, just bear to part with. Easy and unfearing now that November's here and you can't face the not knowing, the maybe being turned down by somebody you could love, someone you want to love you. And um, that's, that's fabulous. That's Thank nice. you. That's yeah, pauses one. full of terrible meaning. Um, our last one is Cal. And, and make sure, again, Chad, that you read the uh, chat section. Things are there for you. All right, Cal. Make sure you unmute. Mute myself. There. I unmuted myself, right? Yes. I want to thank John for giving me the link so I could get here. And uh, we had a nice little chat. Um, I said I was going to read something funny, which he thought was a great idea. And uh, this one, I gave him the title to. This one is called... <clears throat> And this is from my book, by the way. Here's my book with my famous picture on the front by my daughter. And um, this is called On First Looking Into Keats's Accuracy. And it has an epigraph by Keats, uh, which is negative capability. That is when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, which is true, according to this poem. Was he embarrassed? I think not. The early sonnet of Keats, an all-time greatest hit. In fact, a Homer didn't get his career off to a rocky start in spite of its misnomer. Ah, but what is poesy? Must beauty always be truth? When you travel in these realms of gold, can you put Cortez, if it fits the meter, better than Balboa? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Cal. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for being here and John for being our You're featured great. poet and celebrating your book with us. And uh, thank you, everybody, for creating community and reading. And I just... I just want to say all y'all, Sandra didn't read. Um, I was very sad about that. But thank you, everyone, for reading. Your poems are amazing and great. And I know I don't do the chat very well because I tend to accidentally make myself go away. I just wanted to say thank you all. And I loved all your poems and your fabulous and 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 hugs. <laughs> <laughs> Blasted AWP. Thanks, Bye, guys. Be well. Bye. Bye.